Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Edge Hill University. A particular welcome if it's your first visit to the campus. Delighted to welcome everybody along this evening for the latest in our series of inaugural lectures by you professors at the university. And to introduce this evening, Adrian Midgley, who joined us two or possibly three years ago now? Yeah, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Two and a half years ago. Um, from the University of Hull, where he had spent the previous nine years in the Department of um, Sport and Exercise Science. I think it was there, rather than Sport and Physical Activity. Um, this is Adrian's second career. When he left school, he got a job working at a factory in Hull. Um, and he worked there for 14 years. And he tells me he had, he had an interest in doing stuff around, around sport and exercise and and health, and he looked into opportunities in the, the fitness centres around Hull and discovered that, well, there weren't any. And uh, so he went and did a BTEC, and uh, they told him, well, you, you, you're really good at this academic stuff. Um, off you go to university. So he went off to university as a mature student and uh, studied sports science and biology and did his PhD in uh, pretty much record time, I think. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. After, after nine years there, he moved across here, first of all, as, uh, as a reader, and then subsequently as, as a professor. And this evening, he's going to tell us something about that journey, I think, and uh, four or maybe five fascinating facts about exercise, fitness, and health. So without any further ado, <laughs> Professor Midgley. Thank you for that introduction, George. So uh, just before uh, I get into the nitty gritty of this inaugural lecture, I would like to just mention that there is a little bit of a change in content. Uh, as you can see here by the uh, striking out of the number five to a number four. Um, and this is when I was looking at the, the uh, summary of this inaugural lecture, I realized maybe um, that there's really four fascinating facts. Uh, not five, so I had a little bit of a change in the heart and I actually uh, combined two of the fascinating facts into a more general fascinating fact. Secondly, I would like to uh, just say that um, there are um, some limitations uh, that this maybe aren't, these aren't fascinating facts. Uh, us scientists, we don't like facts. Um, usually things are found and then we do more studies and then they find something else that contradict what was found before. Uh, so they're not really facts. And uh, I don't know if they're really fascinating, to be honest, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully you'll be uh, you know, a little bit stimulated. Now, when you ask colleagues who've done these inaugural lectures before, you say, what, what do you need to do in an inaugural lecture? What are the, the key components that you must include? And after consulting with colleagues who've done these before, they said three three key components. First of all, you're a professor now, you need to look academic, you need to look like a serious scientist. So I thought, if it goes a little bit pear-shaped, this inaugural lecture, I thought, how can I get all these key components in my first slide? And then if I've got all of them in my first slide, anything after that will be a bonus. So the first thing is you've got to be academic, a serious academic. So I thought, how can I how can I show that I'm a serious academic? And I thought, well, there's nothing more <laughs> academic than me at my desk pondering all the problems in science. And, uh, and you can see that I'm pondering in front of my bookcase, which is overfilling with scientific books. And obviously, I've read all these books cover to cover. <laughs> and then they said the second thing you need to do is you need to be controversial some controversy, to be a little bit edgy. And how's this for controversy? Bold men are sexy. <laughs> and apparently, if you Google it, there's 13 reasons why this is the case. <laughs> and finally, people are here to be entertained. You need to be humorous. And according to my family, if you stick a wig on the family dog, this is extremely humorous. <laughs> But one of, the, one of the questions is, is whether the dog looks better in a wig, or do I? 
So this is me, Adrian Ridgely, pro professor. And where have I come from? Well, I did work in a factory, as George said, for 14 years. And I'm thinking, this, this is quite hard work, this factory work. And uh, it's not the most stimulating work. So I did a lot of studying, read a lot of textbooks. And then somewhere along the line, I don't know whether it was because uh, of me superior brain power or just luck, I become an exercise physiologist. Now, just to clarify what an exercise physiologist, for those who don't know what that is, sometimes over the years, people said, what do you do? And I say, I'm an exercise physiologist. And they say, well, oh, I've got a, a bad knee. Can you have a look at my knee? Um, and this is a physiotherapist who looks at sports injuries. And that's definitely not what I do. Now, if you look at the human body, there's 11 systems in the human body. And an exercise physiologist looks at how these systems respond to physical exercise. That's either acutely, so how these systems respond during the exercise or immediately after the exercise, or chronically. So if you do physical exercise over days, weeks, months, and years, how do these organ systems adapt to the, 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 the physiological strain of the physical exercise? And my personal interest is in two organ systems. One is the respiratory system, so this is the lungs and how we breathe during exercise. And the other one is the circulatory system, which is related to the heart and uh, the vessels where the blood is uh, moved around the body. <coughs> so as exercise physiologists, we have been accused of torturing people. And I don't know if I can see anybody from any of the ethic. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I have. I've got the chair of the uh, Faculty of Arts and Science Ethics uh, Committee uh, here, so I'll, I'll be careful what I say. But we have been accused of torturing people in our lab, uh, getting them to do exercise, which is extremely painful and, uh, and, and uncomfortable. And if you go past our exercise physiology laboratory in the uh, Wilson building, just over, over there, you might see a machine like this called the isokinetic dynamometer, which is used to measure muscle force. And, and whether us exercise physio physiologists like torturing people, I'll leave it up to you by uh, just showing you an example of a torture chair that was used in medieval times, just so you can have a look at the comparisons. So, enough of humour. <laughs> Exercise, fitness and health is a serious business, it's life or death, and this is what I'm going to try to get across over this inaugural lecture, um, that you know, people can die uh, from the lack of exercise, and that people do exercise, uh, usually live a healthier life. So, fact one, is that exercise is medicine, typically. So it has been said that if you could get all the benefits of physical exercise and put it into a pill, that every GP in the country would be prescribing this pill to every patient. And it says here on this, this prescription, this pill bottle, it says exercise should be taken a minimum of 30 minutes a day, five times a week, uh, five days a week. That's um, the current guidelines for most associations that develop these guidelines but you can actually exercise for three days a week for a minimum of 20 minutes if it's more vigorous exercise. Or you can do a combination of vigorous exercise and more moderate exercise to get your quota of exercise for, for good health. And this has been known for a long time. If we look at a quote from the Earl of Derby, it says, those who think they have not time for bodily exercise will sooner or later have time uh, find time for illness. So in other words, what it's saying is you think, yeah, I ain't got time, I'm too busy. Uh, later on in life, you are much likely to become ill and find time, you know, to manage your illness. So I'm saying here, exercise is medicine, but typically. So when is it not medicine? Well, if we look at the lay press on the news in newspapers, we'll see headlines like this. Runner in 30 seconds collapse, uh, collapses and dies in sweltering heat and crossing the finishing line of a half marathon. And runner dies during round Norfolk relay race. So you might, you ah. might think, I see this all the time in the lay press. Actually, exercise is very bad for you, especially if it's young people who are collapsing. 
and maybe more profound is if we see things like this on the television and this can be a little bit upsetting for some people um, but I can assure you this person actually survived so just have a look on the top left hand side of the screen when it comes up and I'm relying on technology so hopefully we'll be okay top left setting scene but I would say that uh, football player did survive what had happened there is a the football player had actually had a heart attack um, so if you see something like this you think well if someone as fit and as healthy as a football player can just uh, you know keel over with a heart attack you know for the for the lesser mortals um, you know we maybe should avoid exercise and then we see something like this where um, some consultant has said too much jogging is actually bad for your health and this is a statement made on this news. This was in the BBC news. This is quite widely uh, publicised very recently. Uh, you can see there, February 2015. Jogging every day can be as bad for your health as doing no exercise at all, at all according to new research. So they're making, uh, they're making comment about scientific research. In fact, too much jogging or cycling can even be worse than doing nothing, and extreme cases can be fatal. So this is quite confusing uh, for the public on whether exercise is good for you or bad for you. Also, throughout the year, especially since I've been involved in uh, exercise, fitness and health, um, I speak to uh, people who have no sort of uh, real knowledge of the science behind it, and they always seem to know someone who's done no exercise all their life and maybe lived till they was 100 years old. And they think, well, you know, if they're living till 100 years old, um, then, you know, Maybe we don't need to do exercise. And often these people have, um, <laughs> they, they, you know, they do things that scientists are saying you shouldn't be doing. These are bad for your health. We're thinking, well, this lady's doing okay. <laughs> and often they, they have a combination of sedentary lifestyles, drinking and smoking. <laughs> so lots and lots of unhealthy things that scientists uh, should be saying you're doing or shouldn't be doing. So very confusing. So just before I get on to the more serious aspects of, of death and uh, longevity, I would like to just mention uh, the relationship between exercise and immune function. <coughs> and if we do a moderate amount of exercise, what we actually find is that immune function actually improves compared to if you was doing no exercise. In other words, you're sedentary. But when we do higher levels of activity, maybe extreme amounts, we actually find that immune function is suppressed. And when we look at the risk of upper respiratory tract infections, which are usually common colds when you refer to this, we find that when we're sedentary, we have an average risk of these infections. When we engage in moderate amounts of exercise, we have a lower risk. And then when we engaging in lots and lots of exercise, we find that we have a much higher risk, and that's due to immunosuppression when doing too much exercise. So what about the life and death situation? What is, what is the actual reality of doing exercise and the risk of dying? Well, this is the American College of Sports Medicine, American Heart Association, two important associations involved in advising on exercise. And if you read this statement, uh, the risks are actually very, very small. If you're young and you die during exercise, like we saw the football player in the video collapsing due to a heart attack, it's usually because they've got some sort of defect in the heart. And obviously the, the uh, train is actually putting a strain on the heart and, and that can happen. If it's people who are older who are um, dying um, from a heart attack during exercise, it's usually they have some underlying cardiovascular disease. It's uncommon for someone who hasn't got a, a problem, uh, what we call a congenital uh, problem with the heart, something that they had at birth, 
um, or hasn't got an underlying cardiovascular disease, it's very uncommon for them to have a heart attack and die during exercise. Another important point is if we look at this graph, and if we can see here, it's the relative risk of having a heart attack. This dashed line here, this, this represents um, the risk if you were just sat like you're doing now, no, not doing any exercise. And then this is related to the heart attack if you don't do any exercise here and you do e vigorous exercise or if you do more. So this is one to two times a week, three to four, five plus. So the risk decreases when we do exercise in terms of having a heart attack, the more exercise we do. And you can see from people who don't do any exercise to people who um, are doing um, you know, a lot of exercise, the change in risk is considerable. So I think the take home message here if you're sedentary and you think, well, I better do some exercise, it sounds important, or you've had a long layoff uh, from exercise, then if you're doing your exercise, so you're going out for a jog, you shouldn't be looking like this. Take it steady, uh, build up, and uh, listen to your body, I think, is a key message. But that's during the exercise. What about the effects of exercise on, on health and longevity um, you know, when we're not actually exercising. So again, I apologise if you're not used to looking at graphs. Um, I'll try to do it slowly. Um, if we look here, we see relative risk of death. And these are quintiles of exercise capacity. So if we look at all the population and put them into um, what we call quintiles. So this quintile here is the, the people who've got the top 20% of cardiovascular fitness. These are the, the bottom 20% of people uh, in terms of their cardiovascular fitness. So these are the most fit people, these are the least fit people, and these are the people in the middle. And what we find is the relative risk and death actually increases substantially uh, with low fit people. And this is all cause mortality. So this is death from all different causes. Now, one important point that, um, in evolutionary terms, we have evolved to be endurance athletes, hunter-gatherers. So this is how our physiology is, is adapted to be, to be endurance athletes. That's what we're designed to do. As you can see here, this is what's becoming more and more common and becoming more and more sedentary. Now, I like this photo, and I thought, I love this photo. How can I fit it into this inaugural lecture? So I'm going to try my best <laughs> to fit it in without it sounding like I've wedged it in, uh, like a, um, a, a sort of a, a round peg in a square hole type thing. Um, if we look at this, this is a, a, a typical uh, foot of someone in modern life. They wear shoes, so they walk in shoes, they run in shoes. And you can see the feet are all scrunched up. But this is an individual who spent all his life uh, walking and running in bare feet. We can see the feet are flatter, they're wider, they look more stable. So we can say this is a, an, outward, an outward visual representation of maladaptation in the body from our lifestyles, our modern lifestyles. Unfortunately, it's not as easy to see internally uh, this maladaptation occurring. And that brings me on to my second fact. Fact two, exercise testing is useful for evaluating the fitness of athletes and I think uh, a lot of you maybe know that already, but also much more than that. So one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is something called cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Uh, and this is uh, how we can have a look at the whole body reacts to the strains of physical exercise. Now in a clinical setting, uh, what uh, is often done first is a maneuver called the maximum voluntary ventilation. So I'm just going to show you a couple of videos that illustrate both of these tests. So this one's called a maximum voluntary ventilation. So 
the, the subject is breathing in and out as much air as they can in 14 seconds. That's the ventilation, breathing in and out. About two litres every time he breathes in and out. And then what we do then, we get a value in litres per minute. So that's how much air can a person breathe in and out of their lungs in a minute. And then we follow that with a cardiopulmonary exercise test. So again, I've got a video to illustrate this. And I've got some text overlay in the video, but just to explain, what's happening here is the person does a warm up to get the body warm, get the body ready, and then we increase the intensity of the exercise bit by bit and keep increasing, increasing, increasing until the person cannot do any more. So hopefully you'll see that clearly in here, in this video. I'm in the background doing all the work. So this is the beginning of the test. You won't be able to tell, but this treadmill speed is increasing in speed bit by bit. So now this is near the end of the test. Come on, son. Got my hand there just in case he's going to fall off the back. I won't catch him, it's just so I know that he's uh, getting too close to the end. So look how, how he looks, look how exhausted he looks. This is a topic that I'm going to come, uh, come to uh, shortly. So you can see about uh, us exercise physiologists being accused of torturing people. So in a clinical setting, um, this is the main tool that we use for interpreting the um, results of a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And I won't go through all these uh, different graphs. This is called a nine panel plot because it's got nine little graphs in uh, the full plot. And basically what you're looking at is oxygen consumption at the lung, so oxygen uptake of the lung. Um, carbon dioxide production at the lung, you're looking at the person's heart rate and you're also looking at their ventilation, how much air they're breathing in and out and it's just different ways of showing that information and each one of these plots is very important in terms of diagnosing disease, well not, sorry, not diagnosing disease but looking for evidence that are indicative of disease. So this is what you would see in a clinical exercise physiology laboratory See, so we've got the mask on there, measuring ventilation and gas exchange of the lung. It's got an ECG on, looking if there's any heart problems during the test. It's got a blood pressure cuff, so we can have a look if there's any irregular blood pressure responses. And you can't see, you'll see a lead here, and that's what we call a pulse oximeter. It's just attached to the finger, and it shows us how much oxygen is in the blood. So one of the applications that is very interesting in terms of cardiopulmonary exercise testing is um, trying to get an indication whether someone's fit for <coughs> surgery because with major surgery, the strain on the body is very similar to what we see in physical exercise. And this is one of the main <coughs> ways that we can see if someone's fit for surgery. So you can see this graph here. The blue line here represents the relationship between VO2, which is oxygen uptake at the lung, and the carbon dioxide output of the lung, VCO2. <coughs> at, at lower levels of exercise, you can see there's a linear relationship between the two, but as we get to more intense exercise, we get um, an acidosis, so acid is, is being produced in more and more quantities, and we see an inflection point here, where this linear relationship actually changes and, and inflects upwards. This point here where it inflects is called the anaerobic threshold, now, studies have found that if a patient has got an anaerobic threshold of less than 11, then they're at high risk for complications during or after surgery and at high risk for death during the surgery. So this is often used and it's becoming more and more popular. And in fact, I went on a cardiopulmonary exercise testing course a couple of years ago. There was 40 people on the course. There was myself 
and 39 anaesthetists. So a bit, a bit out of place I was. This um, graph here, if we change this VO2 from litres per minute to millilitres per kilo of body weight per minute, you can see this is well under 11. So this individual will be high risk of surgery complications and, and death uh, in particular. So probably uh, would need, if he were doing surgery on him, they would need special care um, and, and get ready, you know, for some uh, problems. <coughs> so this is panel one and panel nine of the nine panel graph. And this is normal man. So this one, someone who's apparently healthy, doesn't look like he's got any disease. And there's two things to note from uh, these, these graphs. One, we can work out what someone's predicted cardiorespiratory fitness. And cardiorespiratory fitness is usually measured in terms of VO2 max. So this line represents this, per, uh, this person's predicted VO2 max based on their age and gender. And you can see in the test, this red line is their VO2. They reach their predicted VO2 max. So that's good. The other thing we note is this line here represents the maximum voluntary ventilation. So that was the test before where the person was ventilating very quickly when they were sat down. So this is their maximum voluntary ventilation. This is how much air they ventilated during the test, so about 120 litres a minute compared to the maximum voluntary, voluntary ventilation of about 200 litres per minute. And we can see there's a big difference. And that's because um, ventilation does not typically limit exercise. That's why there's a big difference. This is called the breathing reserve. And usually, there's different cutoff points, but usually it's 30 litres per minute. The difference between these two, if it's more than that, then the person's not limited by ventilation. So what would we see with someone with heart failure? Heart failure is a, a, a debilitating condition where the heart is very large, very much like an athlete's heart, but it doesn't have the same functionality. It's very poorly performing. The well, first thing we can see is that their VO2 max is very low. So just above one there compared to here where it's about 2.5 and it's a long way from the predicted value so that's the first thing we notice the second thing is that they've still got a large breathing reserve so this would be indicative that this person's not limited by any lung disease but is limited by heart disease what about somebody with lung disease so this is ca um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease again we know, like the heart failure patient, a long way from their predicted VO2 max. But what we see down here is that their ventilation rate during the exercise test encroaches on their maximum voluntary ventilation. In other words, they're showing that ventilation is actually limiting exercise. And this would be indicative of someone who's got lung disease. And another uh, thing that's interesting is that um, these two people, based on their cardiorespiratory fitness alone, would be classified as disabled. They would not be able to carry out activities of daily living, like shopping, doing the garden, etc. I said this is one of my re uh, main research interests, and one of the things that um, are developing at the moment is some uh, research with Professor Simon Rogers at. Um, Aintree Hospital, looking at how we can use cardio, um, cardiopulmonary exercise testing to assess head and neck cancer patients. One of my other um, interests is, is how we can tell when someone's given maximum effort. Because if you notice on them um, graphs I've just shown you in a previous slide, it assumes uh, that people have got to their maximum levels of, um, of the oxygen uptake. If they decide, no, I'm not going to continue, I can't be bothered, I don't see the point to this, we're assuming they've gone to their maximum, and that the maximum values that we see are actually representative of their maximal functional capacity. So one of the things us exercise physiologists do, we try to get an idea of whether someone's given a maximum effort. And two of the more common criteria that we use to decide whether someone's given a maximum effort and likely reach their maximum physiological capacity are these two here. This RER um, is the respiratory exchange ratio. It's an indication of how much acid um, is being produced in the body. 
um, and obviously vigorous exercise is associated with accumulation of acid. And also we use heart rate. So how far did people get towards their age predicted maximum heart rate, which is normally calculated as 220 minus the person's age? But two, well, there's one thing you can see here what's problematic. If we look at the literature and look what exercise physiology are actually using in the literature, you can see there's different cutoff points for both of these criteria. And that's problematic um, because not everybody's using the same value. It's not constant. Um, another study that I did, uh, did was um, it actually found that people can achieve these criteria long before they stop exercise. So in other words, they're satisfied in these supposedly criteria of maximum effort long before the end of a test. So I'm one of the main opponents of using these criteria. And one of the reasons why I don't think these are very useful is because they're based on something called the cardiovascular anaerobic catastrophic model of exercise tolerance. And this model states that when we do exercise and we cre increase in e exercise intensity, the heart cannot pump in any more blood around the body. Therefore, the body cannot deliver any more oxygen. Our cells cannot get any more oxygen. Therefore, we get all this buildup of acid in the muscle. The acid in the muscle stops the muscle from working properly. And then we have this physiological catastrophe where the person just physically cannot do any more exercise. One thing I'm particularly interested in is something called a psychobiological model of exercise tolerance, which states that in most types of exercise, that it's not actually a physiological catastrophe that occurs, <laughs> that people visually, volitionally decide not to exercise anymore. So in this uh, recent study that I conducted, simply asked people, what's the main reason why you stop this cardiopulmonary exercise test? Uh, now, the 60 people, you can see that 16 said leg speed. I just couldn't co keep up with the treadmill. It was going too fast. And that might suggest a, a catastrophic model, that the muscles just uh, not working to keep the leg speed going. But you'll notice that nearly as many people said breathing discomfort was actually the main reason why I stopped the test. And that's not a catastrophic model. That's you know, perception of effort. And you can see other ones, fear of falling, lack of motivation. I reached a goal, so I've just set myself a goal. This is what I'm going to get to. Regardless if I've reached my maximum or not, I'm just going to stop. Another interesting finding was if we find out not just the main reason why they stop, but all the other reasons why they stop the cardiopulmonary exercise test. Remember, this is a maximal test. They're being told you need to push yourself to your maximum we find that only one of the 60 subjects actually just give one main reason. Most people give ma uh, more than one reason. And one person give 11 reasons. So a lot, of things, a lot of information's coming into their brain and they're making a conscious decision to stop that test. Not because it's a, a catastrophe, um, it's because of the, the, the discomfort and other things that are going through their, their head. Another thing, we can do, and again, I like simple science, I'm a simple chap, we can ask them, if you didn't stop the cardiopulmonary exercise test when you did and kept on running, how long do you think it would have been before you either fell on the treadmill or flew off the back? So you can see here that five people, five people said less than 15 seconds, but most people said much more. And in fact, if you look at here, there's, I think is that about nine, it's hard to see from this angle, that about nine people could have said they could have gone for more than two minutes longer. So hardly a maximal test. And it doesn't matter if this is accurate, the people believed that they could have gone much longer than they did. And one way exercise physiologists try to get people to do more, to push themselves more to their, their actual true maximum, is that we shout at them. And you heard me uh, during that uh, video of the cardiopulmonary exercise says you could hear me shouting. So a qualitative study that I did previously to this study, um, we interviewed people after a cardiopulmonary exercise test, was interested in why they stopped. But another thing we was interested in is did they find the verbal encouragement useful? Because as exercise physiologists, I think we, we all um, shout out if uh, you disagree with me, 
Um, we think that verbal encumbrance is always a good thing. Well, let, I'll let you read these. These are what three, three out of ten people who we interviewed said about whether verbal encouragement um, helped them or not. So researchers found that verbal encouragement on average is good, but there's definitely people who do not like it, and it seems that maybe it's actually counterproductive. And even though this is extremely common in research literature that we verbally encourage people to get the best out of them, as exercise physiologists, we don't know what we should say to people to effectively verbally encourage them. We don't know when to say it um, and how often to, to give them verbal encouragement. <coughs> so we've established that cardiovascular fitness is important for good health and longevity. But what sort of exercise do we need to do to improve cardiovascular fitness? Which is, which is the most effective? Well, this is fact three. High intensity exercise is most effective for improving cardiovascular fitness, typically. So this is a, a paper um, that I uh, wrote looking at the evidence of this. I use running as a model because the literature is vast, uh, but this does apply uh, to most other populations. And I provided a physiological rationale why high intensity exercise is the most effective for improving cardiorespiratory fitness. You can see here there's three components. One is skeletal muscle adaptation, one is central cardiovascular adaptation, and the other is, is the pulmonary or lung adaptation. And all these things feed into this. So high intensity exercise, there seems to be a physiological rationale in terms of physiology, of how the strain on these systems improves cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, years ago, if you had heart disease, they would have said, lay in bed, don't do any physical activity. Nowadays, there's 321 registered cardiac rehabilitation centres in the UK. So these rehabilitation centres, um, what they do is you get people who have had a... a a heart attack or surgery, or often both, um, and they're referred to a cardiac rehabilitation. So the main part of cardiac rehabilitation is they do physical exercise. 321 um, registered at the moment. Um, so this is moderate exercise. That's, this is what's been recommended at the moment. But in recent years, um, there is a, a strong interest in looking at high intensity exercise and how that can be used to improve uh, the fitness and quality of life of cardiac patients. Uh, this is a study um, that is uh, just about to start data collection uh, with a, a, a postgraduate student at the moment with Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital and the Nosley Cardiovascular uh, Service. <coughs> so this is what you'll see if you go to a, a phase three cardiac rehabilitation sort of session. A load of people, mostly sort of quite old, um, all doing exercise in a, in a group. So we're measuring quite a few things, you know, measures of cardiovascular fitness, quality of life. But one thing we're particularly interested in is something called heart rate variability. So as you're sat here now in this lecture theatre, you might think that your heart is just pumping nice and constant, um, but that is incorrect. What we actually find is that between beats, the time is actually different. So one beat, you might have an 845 millisecond gap between the next beat, and then the gap between the next beat, 745 milliseconds, and so on. And when I first heard about this heart rate variability, I thought, well, that sounds old, we're having a lot of variability. It sounds like you've got a bad heart. But counterintuitively, it's actually the more, heart, the more variability you have, in your heart rate, uh, you know, these times between beats, the better. So people with high heart rate variability will be less likely to have a heart attack <coughs> and they're more likely to live longer. And we have looked at uh, fitness training over the years and we find that if you do physical training, you will increase heart rate variability. So one thing that we're interested in with these cardiac patients is whether the high intensity interval training is actually more effective than the moderate intensity that they engage in as part of their standard clinical care.
I'm actually quite surprised. I whipped him through this quite quickly. I was, you know, when you're still looking, you think 29 slides, so uh, this is going to be uh, a rush at the end, but uh, yeah, I'm calming down now. So we're pacing ourselves nicely. The only trouble is, though, we're going to have time for questions. <laughs> and that's when I start getting nervous again. So fact four is, is the last uh, fact that I'm going to address. So exercise is effective for weight loss, but generally not as important as what you eat. And I do read a bit of science every now and again. I was just uh, recently perusing through the latest um, journal um, edition of exercise and sports science reviews. Uh, I come across this, this editorial, and it's uh, entitled Debunking the Myth, Exercise and Effective Weight Loss Treatment. And I thought, bah, this is Andy, giving uh, the, uh, you know, the topic of my inaugural lecture. And, and the first sentence in this article um, is here. So it's, uh, this, this author is saying, wow, almost two hours. This was the response from my first great daughter. She finished adding up the number of minutes she had jogged to burn off the calories in a popular chow meal combo from a large fast food chain. And I think this is quite a common perception among people who are not sort of expert in this area. Uh, that if you exercise, maybe you can eat what you want, or you know, the association with how much exercise you would need to do to burn off uh, the calories in a, in, a, in a given amount of food. So, feeling a little bit peckish, anybody? A Mars bar? Feeling a little bit more hungry? Might have a trip down to McDonald's. Got a nice, um, I was going to say a happy meal, but that's because I've got children, it's always in my head. Want a happy meal, want a happy meal. So this is a Big Mac, uh, regular fries. And uh, what some people call a full fat Coke, so one with sugar in rather than uh, sweeteners. And if you're uh, a bit of piggy like me and you're feeling ravenously hungry, you might have a trip down to Pizza Hut and have one of these bad boys. So this is uh, a, a, a stuffed crust uh, pizza, 14 inch. So a nice tasty morsel. So how much exercise would average man need to do to burn off the calories? in these food items. Well, who is average man? Well, in the UK, average man is 38 years old. He weighs 84 kilograms, and he has an average um, cardio fitness of about 39 milliliter of oxygen consumption per kilo of uh, body mass per minute. So that's average man in the UK. So how much exercise is he need, need to gonna do? Mars bar, 27 minutes of exercise. This is moderate exercise. One hour 54 for the uh, McDonald's meal and a whopping five hours 47 minutes of hard labor for his trip down to Pizza Hut. But what about Mrs. Average, his wife? Mrs. Average in the UK is 40 years old, weighs 70 kilos, and has a VO2 max of about 32. Are you ready? So this is moderate, this is moderate exercise. This would be, um, if you looked at your maximum heart rate, so 220 minus your age, this would be about 70% of your maximum um, predicted heart rate, which is equivalent to about 55% of the um, maximum amount of oxygen that you can um, take in at the lung during intense exercise. But that's not the old story. There is good news, people. We expend energy during the exercise, but we also expend e exercise, uh, energy after the exercise. Some people call this the afterburn. Us exercise physiologists, we call this the excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. I prefer afterburn, for obvious reasons. So we can see from this study here that if I do 300, or on average, if people do 300 kilocalories worth of exercise, that afterwards um, we'll expend about another 40 um, kilocalories. That's in the first hour after exercise. I think one of the take-home messages here is that 
If we split this 300 kilocalories of continuous exercise into two 150 um, kilocalorie bouts of exercise with a gap in the middle, we actually increase the post-exercise energy expenditure above rest. So the take-home message here is you don't need to get all your exercise in one go. So if you're going for a brisk walk around campus to improve health, instead of doing a full 20 minutes, you might split up into two 10-minute blocks. And for weight loss, that's a good thing. The other thing we found is that even though these were isocaloric, in other words, there was 300 kilocalories of energy expenditure in the running and 300 kilocalories of energy expenditure in the uh, cycling, we actually found post-exercise in the running there was a significantly higher energy expenditure. So the take-home message here is for the same amount of energy expended during the exercise, you will expend more energy after the exercise if you do running rather than cycling. Another interesting thing is that most of the energy expenditure that, um, that um, goes on during a typical person's day is actually their basal metabolic rate. So this is the energy expended just to support life. So if we just sat around, like you're doing now all day, you would expend a certain amount of energy just to sustain all your physiological functions. So we were interested in this. And the standard is 3.5 millilitres per kilo per minute. So that's how much oxygen that we're meant to consume at rest per kilo of body weight per minute of lounging around. And that is directly um, related to how much energy we're expending, because we need the oxygen to generate energy. When we did this study, we actually found the average was 3.2, not 3.5. So in other words, at rest, on average, people do not expend as much energy as we first thought. But the more startling finding was the range. So person who had the lowest rest in energy expenditure was a, a value of 2. The person with the highest rest in energy expenditure was 4.4. And if we look at the values in terms of their requirements for energy from food during a day, the person with the lowest energy requirement is just over 1,200 kilocalories a day compared to the person with the highest, which is uh, 2,661. And please remember that this is um, sort of controlled um, by body mass. So, you know, we, we divide the number by body mass. So it's not that the bigger people need more energy, because that's um, it's been divided by their body mass. So this goes to um, sort of highlight that some people who say, yes, I can eat a lot of food and I don't put any weight, this would maybe suggest that that is actually true. I'm blooming impressed with myself. Very good time. So acknowledgements. I've had the honour and privilege to work with a lot of good people over the years, and I'm still working with most of them, uh, doing research on these interesting topics. So I'd like to thank these people. As I say, you're only as good as the people you work with. I'd also like to thank all the um, students and colleagues at Edgehill University for their support. This Wiley campaigner in particular, who's had the most impact on my academic career. And uh, lastly, and certainly not least, is my lovely family. And I say, uh, I have uh, spent a lot of hours over the years studying, and you know, I'm on my head in my books, and children are asking me questions, so I do apologize for that, if I'm maybe not as attentive as I should be. And the final slide is maybe the, the take-home message. Exercise can be bad for you, but generally, it's very good for you. Um, build up slowly if you're not already exercising, or if you are exercising already, then you know, and you want to do higher intensity exercise again. Build up slowly, and if you are trying to control your weight, what you need to do is make sure that you don't uh, get your head in the fridge and start eating too much, um, and it's putting all your good work um, at risk. Thank you very much.
Right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Kevin Verney, uh, Associate Dean in the, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And uh, as Adrian mentioned uh, during his talk, uh, he is uh, now happy to, to take a few questions on some of the issues he raised. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions for him. And I think we perhaps do have some mic uh, microphones going round, so if you please stick up a hand, if you can wait till the, uh, the microphone uh, comes to you so that we, we catch it. Uh, uh, in the, the recorded version of the, the talk this evening. Can I just add there that you've forgotten a bit about only an easy question? <laughs> only easy questions, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, do we have any, ha have any questions? Oh, we're going to get off lightly. Oh. Uh, yeah, we have, have one at the front, uh, down at the front here. Very easy question, Adrian. Oh, thank okay. you, <laughs> I, I'll buy you a coffee. Uh, <laughs> okay, you, know. you know, you talked about continuous exercise, yeah. and then you talked about the interval, and, yeah. and, and we can go for walks around the, the campus mm -hmm. for 10 minutes twice, instead of doing it's continuously. Yeah. What's the gap? What's, what's the, is there a there, critical there interval? There isn't no gap there whatsoever. Uh, so, uh, again, there's someone who's more of an expert in the audience than me, uh, who uh, could probably answer this better. I mean, <laughs> He's turning around, uh, but <laughs> yeah, there's a, a, a quite a large body of evidence now that you don't need to do, you know, the, this, you know, remember the one of the slides where we had the, 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 the pill uh, container, and it's saying this is, you know, the, the sort of the minimum what you should be doing uh, for good health and longevity. And what they're saying now from, from sort of accumulated evidence is that you can just accumulate it throughout the day. It doesn't matter if it's an hour gap or two hours. You just need to accumulate a certain amount of physical activity. And I wouldn't say uh, maybe if you go to the extreme that you're doing like five seconds sort of quick thing. In. I don't know if that's true. But, you know, uh, you know, you need to be getting a little bit out of breath. Maybe, uh, I don't know, a little bit sweaty. Uh, that, that's what you need to be doing. A short, short period of time is fine. Thank you. Okay, we have, have anyone else? Yep, uh, next It door. is a very nice question. <laughs> I was just thinking about your, your basal metabolic rate and you, you showed that there's quite a variation when you've corrected for body weight. Yeah. Is there an influence of age on that? Does it change with age? There is, yeah. The main uh, predictors are age and uh, uh, gender, obviously, and uh, body composition is a big one. So... What, what we do know is people with large surface area to so body volume ratios um, lose a lot of heat. So your body has to sort of be more metabolically active to keep its uh, you know, core temperature. And so we find that and obviously lean individuals have got more skeletal muscle mass um, than you know, fatter individuals if we, if we divide um, you know, each individual's um, sort of divide their values by their weight. And obviously skeletal muscle is, is more uh, metabolically active than than fat adipose tissue, so you know, that's, the, that's the reason for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, a question over this side. Is this going to be a psychological question? <laughs> <laughs> hey, great talk, Mitch. I um, just want to pick up on the point you mentioned about exercise as medicine. Um, oh. Some evidence now coming out of Europe suggesting that westernised governments are trying to get people to be more physically active, it's actually working. But there's an increased rate of people becoming injured and go into A&E, and as a result, maybe putting an economic burden upon the NHS. So I was just wondering what your viewpoint or take would be on that, given... On, on musculoskeletal injury? Yeah, as a result of increased exercise yeah, uptake. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point, that, um, because uh, I did think of that um, beforehand, you know, whether I should make this point, uh, you know, about exercise is medicine typically, and that is one of the, you know, obviously things, you know, you put in a lot of strain on the body, either physiologically or physically, uh, and that's obviously you know, going to predispose you to, to injury when you do that. So again, build up slowly. It does take a long time for the body to adapt, and if you don't, um, then uh, you, know, you are going to be you're susceptible to injury. And I'm a classic example of that, because I was, uh, a few of my colleagues know this story. I was, um, I moved to, uh, from, uh, to Wigan, and I thought, right, I look on the internet, find myself a gym, get fit, as I've just moved, um, and I found a Thai boxing gym. I, did, I have a, a strong history of martial arts, and I thought, bah, I'll go there, I'll take it easy. Uh, what I should have done, obviously, is get back to the gym, get some baseline fitness, then go to this Thai boxing. But I thought, no, I won't do that. Go crazy. 
and uh, six weeks before I suffered a complete rupture of my Achilles tendon. So that's exactly the, you know, the point that your body does uh, need a lot of time to adapt um, to make sure you don't get maladaptation rather than a, a positive adaptation. Okay, uh, question at the back. Hey, you talked about the um, calories required um, for an individual. I'm just wondering, is there any guidance available or is there a way you can establish how many calories you actually need to um, take on board as an individual for, to be part yeah, of like an effective I mean, training plan? Yeah, if you go on the internet, there's a load of these uh, sort of calorie calculator things. I mean, you can look in textbooks for the most people, that's not accessible. But you, you know, you can go on these calorie cal calculators, but I think what you've got to be careful of is is how them calculators, you know, what, what's the mathematics, what sort of sums are they doing in the background? Because as we can see, um, if they're not accounting, accounting for things like uh, age, gender, body composition, then they can be quite inaccurate. But yeah, just have a, lo a look on there. I mean, often they just you know, give a figure for a man, this is what he should be consuming if you're sort of not very... Um, active or sedentary, or you're moderately active or highly active, but you definitely don't want to be using them. Um, but again, weigh yourself every now and again, and that will give you a guide, you know, if you maintain a stable body weight or not. Okay, do we have any more questions? Uh, yep, down the side. I've been to these inaugural lectures, and nobody <laughs> uh, has got any questions. Well, lots of questions because you were very interesting. Yeah. I don't know if um, this is relevant, but it has been in the news recently that um, suggesting that some people should jog early in the morning, but they'd be better off jogging later. But, you know, I didn't know if you knew Is that in terms of uh, body fat or health? Um, I'm not sure. It was just a very brief... It's a good question, that. Uh, if in terms of health, um, you'd be more at risk from having a cardiac event... Um, in the morning, cortisol levels are high. There's a hormone, a stress hormone, and obviously you've been at rest. Um, you know, you've been laid down for quite a lot of hours, and you get up. You know, so if you do exercise in the morning, you know, start off a lot more gently. Make sure that you're awake and you, you know, everything's uh, sort of um, working uh, nicely, ticking over. In terms of um, weight management and losing body fat, it is actually a good idea to exercise in the morning because, um, as I say, cortisol levels are at their, um, at their highest. And let me get this, this right. Um, and it's, I'm trying to think of the physiology behind this, or the, the biochemistry. But there's a, an important uh, enzyme called hormone-sensitive lipase. It's important in, in fat metabolism. And I think it's... Maybe got this the wrong way round. But in the morning, there's a hormone that, it's, that um, interferes with this enzyme. Uh, no, sorry. Can anybody help me out here to answer this question? <laughs> I, know, I know this actually quite well, but I've been put under pressure and now I, I can't get it right. But no, th th this enzyme um, in the morning, it, it's, it's more um, active. There's something happens later on in the day where this enzyme gets inhibited. So you're more likely to burn fat in, in the morning. As soon as you have uh, breakfast and take in carbohydrates, uh, it's insulin. Insulin's at its lowest in the morning. So if you don't have any breakfast, um, you're going to uh, not inhibit this important enzyme in fat metabolism. As soon as you start eating, um, this um, important enzyme starts becoming inhibited, you know, by the, by the insulin levels which are responding to the you know, the, the, the carbohydrates in your diet. Um, so, yeah, moderate um, before breakfast, and that will aid fat metabolism. I do apologise. I do, did look a bit an amateur answering that question. <laughs> I do teach uh, research men statistics predominantly now, so sometimes my physiology is a bit rusty. OK, do we have any other questions for Adrian? Uh, yep, on this side. Uh, just one, one quickie. Um, I forgot the um, the slides you had, but one of the slides on there, you were showing that the women would have twice the time factor. Uh, was it the twice the time factor or twice the? Uh, you, you know, do you remember the slide you had? Why would that be? 
Is this to terms with um, expending calories? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I haven't worked it out as a percentage, but um, what is it about? One was four, and the... Oh, you've picked it up there now. Yeah, that's yeah, right, yeah. Not uh, twice as much, probably um, about 30 to uh, 40 Forty percent more, maybe. Mm. Um, I mean, the main reason is um, that the women are smaller, so fourteen kilograms uh, less, and they're uh, less fit uh, than the man. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I will. I will qualify that statement that we're looking at Mrs. and Mr. Average in the UK. Yeah. So, well, so it's men have bigger hearts. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, <laughs> this is starting to get ugly. <laughs> it's it's funny funny actually you mentioned that because you remember when the Russians set, spent, sent up Sputniks, mm -hmm. they sent a woman woman first. Right. Uh, well, you probably were of this because the women apparently they considered were um, fitter, not so much fitter, but weight for weight there was more. You know, you probably know that, don't you? Uh, Russia. I don't know anything about Russia. All so right. I do apologise. Okay, do we, do we have any further questions for Adrian? Uh, yep, over on this side now. I hope I'm on over time. Um, <laughs> it, it's known um, recently that there is a significant genomic up and down regulation associated with major trauma. With uh, what trauma, sorry? With major trauma. Ah, yeah. So um, many, many thousands of genes are changed and the protein interpretation of these genes is changed as a result of major trauma. Yeah. Is there any work to suggest that exercise either influences this or alters the genomic uh, in interpretation to make you fitter for surgery? I'm not aware of any um, studies that have looked at... Um, you know, changing uh, gene expression from exercise in relation to surgery. And so, I mean, it's not my area of research, but certainly um, the genetics of um, exercises is a big area. Mm. Uh, there's some, you know, big researchers doing research in that area for a lot of years, uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of any that have associated that with fitness for surgery. And, and using your s statistical hat, uh, do you think that there is, this is a, an area where big data is going to be more important, um, looking at every single aspect of every single measurement? Uh, and my interpretation of big data is it comes straight off the machines and goes into the computer. And it's currently too sophisticated for mere mortals to try and understand, yeah. but big data and neural networks should be in a position to hopefully understand it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Definitely. I mean, in, in medical research, this is the way everything's going now. You know, I mean, I mean some of these, uh, you know, predictive models, thousands and tens of thousands of uh, people are involved. So I definitely agree with you that, um, yeah, this is, this is the way to go. Big, big data. Unfortunately, in our discipline of exercise physiology, very small data is, is the norm. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I agree with you. It's not, again, something that I know much about. But yeah, I would agree uh, that big data is, is the way to go in this type of predictive modelling. Okay, I think we're, we are probably entering injury time now, so we, we do have a, a one final question for, for Adrian before we finish. Anyone else? Okay, well, it's uh, my great uh, privilege and pleasure then to uh, present the vote of thanks uh, this evening. And uh, as Many of you know, you know, I'm actually, uh, my, my research area is American history. And thinking of um, Adrian's uh, subject for tonight, it did remind me of two of the perhaps most uh, best known phrases of the late uh, Henry Ford, who lived to the age of 83. And I'm sure you've heard both of them. One is that he said, uh, history is uh, mostly bunk, and uh, exercise is bunk. Uh, if you are healthy, uh, you don't need it. Uh, if you're sick, you shouldn't take it. Now, uh, to be fair to Henry Ford, I suspect he has been a little bit misunderstood there because uh, not that many years after opening, after saying that, those two remarks, he did actually open a history museum uh, near his uh, Detroit car plant. And in fact, uh, what Henry Ford objected to was not the study of history itself, but the fact that it placed too much prominence on uh, great military leaders and politicians as opposed to other groups of individuals uh, like inventors, 
and, yes, industrialists. And I suspect, too, it wasn't so much uh, exercise that Henry Ford opposed, but rather the misleading claims and interpretations that were often been placed upon its uh, potential benefits. And uh, I think Adrian has uh, you know, ably uh, highlighted and exposed some of the problems with uh, some of the claims, that, particularly more often claims in the popular press, that are made about the benefits or otherwise of exercise uh, this evening. At the same time, I think, of course, he has also demonstrated that for people like patients with uh, heart-related illnesses, uh, rather than being uh, something you shouldn't take, uh, exercise is actually a key part of the recovery and rehabilitation process. And I was thinking back to those uh, initial aims, you remember, that Adrian put up in his first slide this evening, where he said, you know, what, he, uh, the, what any uh, inaugural lecture should do. And I think I'm sure you would all agree with me. Well, first of all, he has certainly presented us with some fascinating uh, uh, information and, uh, and uh, arguments and debate. Uh, he has certainly uh, demonstrated that he is academically informed. He has uh, challenged conventional wisdoms. And uh, he has also, of course, I think, uh, demonstrated uh, a sense of humor. And uh, his work, of course, uh, is uh, it, it, uh, quite literally, potentially, uh, life-changing. Now, uh, I'm sure Adrian will be happy to take uh, a few more questions over some refreshments and a glass of wine or two that we have outside for you. And I guess that however much you partake of tonight, you know, you can probably uh, take comfort from the fact that it'll be a lot healthier than going down to Pizza Hut. Uh, <laughs> but uh, before we uh, enjoy those refreshments and allow uh, Adrian to have a, a well-earned glass of wine himself, uh, if you can uh, join with me once again in thanking him for his uh, very stimulating talk and lecture this evening. Thank you.